Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Red Donkey Projections. I'm Lucas, and as I mentioned in the previous video, Eric is not available this week to record with me, so I'll be going it alone. And today we'll be going over our 2022 Senate election predictions. As a reminder, this is a very early uh, election prediction. We still have uh, more than a year to go, but this is what we have down so far. And with that being said, let's get right into it. So while I put in the safe states, uh, I will remind you all that we do our predictions based on what we believe the election will look like on election day. So not necessarily if the election was held today, I think that would give a better representation of where we think each race would stand. It would would be more useful uh, for audience members to understand, you know, what we think is going to happen uh, in these elections. So with that being said, I'll also give another reminder that uh, our margins are 15 plus for safe. Lake likely is five to 15. Lean is less than five or rather one to five. And then tilt is less than one point. So let's start off with the likely states. I'll start with Missouri. Uh, Eric Greitens looks like he's going to be the nominee. However, he does actually face some opposition. I believe uh, I forgot his name, but the the auctioneer from uh, the auctioneer from Missouri. Oh, Billy Long. Billy Long. Uh, he's a representative. I believe he is actually challenging Eric Greitens in this primary. But Eric Greitens does have, I believe, a, or not that he does have, but he is a strong supporter of Donald Trump, which could prove to be good for him in the primary. But we haven't seen Donald Trump jump into the race quite yet. Uh, potentially, he could face a decent candidate in uh, either Jay Nixon, who is the former governor, uh, or as we mentioned before, uh, uh, Jason Kander, but he does look like that. He It does look like he has declined to run in this race. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, Jason Kander ran 16 points ahead of uh, Hillary Clinton in the 2016 Senate election when he was running against uh, Roy Blunt back then. So what do we think will happen if Jay Nixon were to really run against Eric Greitens? I think the margin could end up going down to a likely because Eric Greitens is a pretty bad candidate. He is uh, he has a lot of scandals against him, very embattled politician to the point where I believe the margin would be around, you know, maybe 10, 11 points as opposed to a blowout over 15 points, at least for now. Heading out to Iowa, I think this one depends on who exactly Republicans will run. If Char- uh, Chuck Grassley were to run again, I think this would be absolutely safe because he is a, a very strong candidate. If not, the race could go down to likely because Abby Finkenhauer, who is a representative, a former representative in Iowa, she lost re-election in 2020 to Ashley Hinson. Uh, it could bring the march down to a lean, but a likely. But for now, uh, I'll assume that Chuck Grassley is running for re-election, so we'll go with a safe for that. For the state of Ohio, uh, Tim Ryan, who is the current representative there here, who is probably going to get gerrymandered out, uh, is likely to face either J.D. Vance or uh, Josh Mandel. I think Josh Mandel does look like it does look like he's coalescing that evangelical Republican support behind him for the primary uh, to the point where potentially he could uh, be the one that will go up against Tim Ryan. I think Josh Mandel is a really bad candidate. Uh, he has said a lot of controversial things. He has he's a campaign as being very far right, which could turn off a lot of those moderate suburban voters. However. As we've seen in the recent years, Ohio has trended a lot to the right, especially with its rural areas, which makes us think that it probably will end up going in a likely for now, uh, because Tim Ryan is a pretty decent candidate and Josh Mandel is not so great of one. But the given the current political culture in the state now, uh, we're going to go with the likely, especially considering that Trump won the state by uh, by, I believe, eight points in 2020. I realize I missed New York. That is definitely safe. D, and I missed Alabama as well. That should be safe. R. So now heading to the state of Colorado is Michael Bennett. So Michael Bennett is, I guess, technically more of a moderate senator. I don't think he'll face really good opposition against him. 
Uh, as we've seen, Colorado has moved a lot to the left in recent years with Joe Biden winning the state by 13.5% in 2020, which was a lot more than some expected. Uh, in addition, you know, in 2020, if you all remember, uh, John Hickenlooper, the former governor, ran against Cory Gardner and defeated him uh, by around nine points. So Cory Gardner was a better candidate. I don't think Cory Gardner will run here, given the leftward trending of the state. It'll probably go into likely. And it's honestly pushing safe, depending on who the nominee is. It could go over 15 percent in some situations. Heading now to South Carolina, Senator Tim Scott is here. I think it's a likely uh, I just think the margins will be close enough. Uh, I believe the African-American vote could come out more, although, again, we don't know who the nominee will be running against him, wh- who it will be. Uh, but, you know, Democrats, uh, maybe they learned their lesson from 2020, not to focus too much on this day, because as we saw with Jamie, Jamie Harrison and Lindsey Graham, people were thinking Lindsey Graham would actually lose, and obviously that did not end up happening. Uh, Heading now to Alaska, this is an interesting one because Alaska now has adopted a ranked choice voting system. So uh, uh, Lisa Murkowski, who is the current very moderate senator, Republican senator from the state, doesn't have to does not have to really worry about a primary challenge. But she is facing a right wing uh, Trump back challenge in uh, Kelly Chewbacca. Chewbacca, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce it. But, uh, you know, she's she's been campaigning under Donald Trump or with Donald Trump support, you know, I think she even had a letter from him, you know, saying that she was going to defeat Lisa Murkowski because she is a very moderate senator. In this election, I believe it will be likely whether it's Lisa Murkowski or Kelly Shabaka. I got to wait on predicting that because it'll be very interesting to see how people end up splitting their votes. I think it comes down to how many of the people who voted for the Democratic candidate would put Lisa Murkowski as their second choice? That could be the decider here, because I think a lot of Democrats would be more willing to put Lisa Murkowski as their second choice. She is more of a moderate voter. The reason why that uh, I put this one as likely not safe is because Alaska has been trending a lot to the left recently. Uh, In 2020, Joe Biden won Anchorage for the first time uh, in a very long time for a Democrat. And uh, for the first time, Alaska went to the Republican in under double digits. It, I think it went in just around 10 points. So we'll, this is a, definitely a state to keep an eye on. And I'll definitely be keeping an eye on who we think will win, either Kelly Shabaka or Lisa Murkowski, since that will have a pretty big impact on the Senate. Heading down to Florida, this is an interesting state because Democrats are running a pretty strong candidate in Val Demings, a very well-known a uh, representative in Central Florida. I don't know about statewide, though. I think she does need to work on name recognition around there. She was considered for vice president in 2020 by Joe Biden. She eventually was not chosen, uh, but she's running against Marco Rubio. And the problem with running against Marco Rubio is Marco Rubio is very strong with those Hispanic voters, especially in Miami-Dade County. And as Eric and I have reiterated throughout our channel, <laughs> I'll say throughout our channel, but Throughout several videos we made from Bill Nelson to the 2020 election, Miami-D Democrats have not done the best with getting their voters out. Uh, for example, I think we mentioned the Bill Nelson video. In 2016, Democrats only got 66% of their voters out in 2018, when Republicans managed to get out 95 of those Miami-D voters. So given, first of all, Mark Rubio's strength in that county, plus the fact that Miami-D Democrats aren't the best at getting their votes out, I think it'll go into likely. Uh, we saw in 2016, Marco Rubio won by around like 11 points against, I think it was Mark Harris. I don't, I don't think that first name is correct. Uh, oh no, sorry, sorry. It was uh, Murphy, something Murphy. Uh, we saw him win. He did not win Miami Day, but he actually narrowed the margin down a lot, especially impressive because Trump lost Miami-Dade by, I think, like 27 points to Hillary in 2016. But uh, Rubio was able to cut the margin down by a lot. So that one is likely our for now. Um, Heading now to 
let's do uh, Nevada first. Nevada, I think this is Catherine Cortez Mosto, uh, likely going to be against Adam Laxalt. I have this one as lean for now. Uh, I think that Cortez Mosto is a pretty decent candidate. She was also considered for vice president, but ended up turning down the offer, uh, or not the offer, but turning down the ability, the offer to be vetted for vice president. I think this one's a lean because Nevada, the areas in Las Vegas and Reno should be blue enough. I know that uh, Clark County is trending to the left, but I don't think it'll be changing too much yet. And I do want to quickly mention in general, I think Eric discussed this in one of the previous videos that he made by himself about, you know, falling approval rating of Joe Biden because of the Delta variant in Afghanistan. I think those will be factors in this election, but it'll be much smaller by the time we get to election day. I think that uh, by the time the election day comes, a lot of this might be forgotten. Uh, I don't think people will really take this all into account too much. Of course, that is going to be dependent on what COVID looks like a year from now. Uh, but I don't think uh, voters will really care a, a lot about Afghanistan a year from now. I think they'll be more concerned with domestic policy and you know how COVID-19 is going. Obviously, we can't predict how COVID-19 is going to be going uh, in a year, which does make our forecasting a little bit more difficult, but uh, we're doing the best we can. The state of New Hampshire is interesting. As I've mentioned before, uh, Chris Sununu is still debating whether or not he wants to jump in or not. So currently he has still not announced whether or not he would be jumping in. Uh, but I will say this, if he chooses not to jump in, it's likely D. If he chooses to jump in, I believe it's tilt R. So uh, I know some people are saying that it's lean R, especially I think UEP is saying a lot that it's lean R. Or I don't know if, I don't know if he's still saying it, but I, I know he was saying it before. Uh, but I think that Chris Sununu will not definitely not be as great as a candidate uh, for a federal level position like the Senate compared to his landslide victory as governor because these issues are being nationalized now. Well, as for example, his views on abortion, I believe he's less moderate on abortion than a lot of the other Northeast governors are. His support for Donald Trump might be criticized as well as a lot of the other Northeast Republican governors did not support Donald Trump uh, for president. Uh, but no, you know, he did. As a result, we'll put this one as likely for now. And I'll, I'll emphasize this for now because if Sanudu jumps in, it's definitely tilt R. But he has not yet jumped in, and we don't know whether or not he is going to. The second he jumps in, it becomes tilt R, at least for now. The state of Georgia. Uh, this one's interesting. Right now, it looks like it's going to be, be between Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock. Uh, the problem with Herschel Walker uh, is the several scandals he has, which Eric and I discussed in, I believe, the last video or two videos ago that we made. If he is the nominee, I do see Raphael Warnock winning probably in a tilt margin. I think we had it as lean before, but I do believe now it will be closer. Uh, you know, Herschel Walker does have a potential primary challenge in Gary Black. But Donald Trump did endorse Herschel Walker. And as we know, uh, Donald Trump's endorsement has plays a huge role now in Republican primaries. But I think in the event Herschel Walker gets nominated, he would lose eventually to Raphael Warnock. Arizona, I think Mark Kelly is a pretty strong candidate. Republicans have not put up a super strong candidate yet. I think, I think they nominated the Attorney General, uh, I believe, Brnovich for the Senate seat. You know, I don't, I don't think he's a super strong candidate, so that does make me more inclined to say probably lean to tilt Republican deaths or Democratic. I'll go with lean for now, but this could end up changing because Mark Kelly did do, he can do, probably do pretty well in a primary, or not the primary, but in the general election. So that marks 50, so that is uh, our official call that Democrats will keep the Senate. Uh, but let's head to Pennsylvania now. Uh whether it's going to be John Fetterman or uh, or Connor Lamb, but they still have the primary. That's going to happen. They're probably going to be facing Sean Parnell, uh, who is I believe an author. Actually, he has held no elective service before, but he is endorsed by Donald Trump. Uh, as a reminder, Pat Toomey is retiring from this Senate seat, so this is a probably the strongest opportunity for Democrats to pick up a seat. And I do believe Democrats will pick up the seat, although 
we had as lean before. I think it's more of a tilt given current conditions with COVID-19 and the uncertainty of what it'll look like in a year from now. But for now, I do see either John Fetterman, whether it be John Fetterman or Connor Lamb defeating Sean Parnell. Uh, as some of you might know, John Fetterman is more of a progressive candidate who is the current lieutenant governor, uh, Connor Lamb more of a moderate who as a representative. I think it'll be a very interesting primary to see who ends up winning it. Two Western Pennsylvanian uh, candidates will be vying for this. We'll make a separate video in the future about our predictions on the primary because this one is one definitely one to watch. North Carolina is another interesting one. Um, this one also has a retiring senator. Uh, Richard Burr is retiring. Uh, I wouldn't say he was a moderate. He was definitely not a moderate, but he ended up becoming more anti-Trump towards the end of uh, you know, his term. He voted for impeach for convicting Donald Trump in the impeachment trial. And his successor definitely will be much more conservative if it's a Republican, should he uh, should they win the general election. So Republicans, there is three main ones running this race. There is uh, Ted Budd, a representative, Mark Walker, also representative, and Pat McCrory, the former governor and very unpopular governor of this state. You know, when Mark Walker, Wa Mark Walker first jumped in, you know, we were all saying he's going to be the winner of the Republican primary. That has obviously changed a lot recently. First of all, with Pat McCrory hopping in, in the recent polls uh, since him jumping in, he's been like, dominating the Republican primary. But things obviously have changed a lot recently with the Donald Trump's endorsement of Ted Budd again, um, you know, his endorsement does carry a lot of weight now in primary elections. Pat McCrory is a pretty bad candidate. That I will say for sure. He lost in 2008 for governor and he lost again in 2016. He signed the controversial bathroom uh, bill regarding uh, transgender people who uh, want to use, a, uh, who wish to use one bathroom or another. And Democrats have nominated a pretty solid candidate in Sherry Beasley. You know, she did lose her re-election campaign for uh, chief justice by the narrowest of margins, but she still ran ahead of Joe Biden by like one point something percent. That being said, however, I don't think that she would be able to pull out a win. I think the only Democrat who could pull out a win here is Roy Cooper, the former or the current governor who ran like five points ahead of Joe Biden. Um, but I think it will still be close. And I'm thinking lean. I think we might have had this one as tilt before, but given the uncertainty of if Pat McCrory is really going to be the nominee, plus the uncertainty of how COVID's going to look like, I think it's safer that we go with a lean prediction. And finally, is the state of Wisconsin. You know, Wisconsin's another interesting one. Ron Johnson's the current senator here. I think I saw this funny tweet by someone. I don't remember who it was. I think it was Akko on Twitter, but. You know, it was Ron Johnson is a uh, representative of a competitive state and acts like he's part of the Tea Party Caucus. You know, he's a he's a very or sorry, the Freedom Caucus, but he's a he's a very strong Trump supporter. Although uh, recently uh, there were some leaked uh, things about that, what he said, admitting that, you know, Trump lost the election, but he has to appeal to the base here. And again, he, he hasn't made it clear whether or not he will be running for re-election yet. Uh, should he retire, the likely nominee will probably be uh, Representative Mike Gallagher, who is a, uh, as I said, a representative. He's more of a moderate candidate as well. He chose not to vote to uh, overturn the election results, and uh, he was part of that group that, that signed that letter. That being said, Democrats are still a little, you know, they haven't really fully decided on who they're going to be nominating yet. There's Sarah Godlewski, who is the current state treasurer. She won statewide before. So if some people think that's a strength of her. Mandela Barnes, the progressive lieutenant governor. And also been mentioned is Tom Nelson. I believe he was a, uh, he's a city executive, I think somewhere at that level. Uh, I don't think Democrats really have a shining candidate that can easily defeat a Republican here. And Given that COVID has been getting worse recently, 
Uh, and again, we, we don't know what it's going to look like a year from now. I'm, I am more inclined to give it to the Republicans now. Before I did hold back, I put it as a toss-up. I, I'm probably going to put it as tilt R for now. Uh, we have still to wait for what the situation is going to look like a year from now. But if Ron Johnson chooses to run again, I think he will probably do worse than Mike Gallagher because of what, is, what he said, it's going to really turn off a lot of those suburban voters. As we saw, Joe Biden won not through the uh, the Driftless area, but from the Wow counties that helped provide his victory. And also, he actually did pretty well in some of the rural areas uh, in the Northwest, I believe, as well. But, you know, we will wait and see and see what COVID looks like uh, a year from now. And that marks the end of the video for today. Thank you all so much for watching. If you like this episode, please hit the like button. If you like our content, please subscribe. And if you have any feedback for us in the comments about our predictions, leave them down below. And we'll see you in our next episode tomorrow. See ya.